There is no room in the inn. <laughs> Welcome. Once upon a time there was a, a young boy and his name was Timmy. And Timmy, for Christmas, desperately wanted a new bicycle. And so he decided to appeal to God and he sat down one Saturday afternoon and wrote a letter. He wrote, Dear God, if you bring me a bicycle for Christmas, I promise I will be a good boy for one whole year. Love, Timmy. But then he looked at the letter and he thought that, well, a year was a long time. <laughs> and he crumpled up that letter and he threw it in the trash. He began again, Dear God, if you bring me a bicycle for Christmas, I promise I'll be a good boy for six whole months. And then he looked at that, he thought too much. He crumpled that up, threw that in the trash, began again. Dear God, if you bring me a bicycle for Christmas, I promise I will do the dishes every day for three months. And he looked at that and thought that maybe that was a little too much to ask too. So he gave up on his letter writing. Timmy quit. And the following Sunday, Timmy went to church. And as he walked into church that day, he looked up at the side altar and discovered a beautiful statue of Mary, the mother of God. And he had seen the statue many, many times before, every Sunday in fact. But on this Sunday, the statue touched Timmy in a special way. And so when church was finished, Timmy asked his parents if it was alright if he stayed behind in church. And Timmy lived on the same block as the church, so his parents agreed. And Timmy sat in the pew until everyone else had left the church. And then once everyone else had left the church, Timmy, he walked up to the front of the church and came before the statue of Mary. And looking up at Mary, Timmy smiled. And then turning around to make sure there was nobody else left in the church, Timmy reached up and he took the statue down. And then Timmy took the statue home. <laughs> and then Timmy put the statue in his bedroom under his bed. And then Timmy wrote God another letter. <laughs> Timmy wrote, Dear God, I've got your mother, bring me my bicycle. It wouldn't be much of a Christmas without your mother. Love, Timmy. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Lord, come into our lives tonight. Open our hearts and our minds. Draw us nearer to each other and nearer to you. And give us courage to see the people that we are courage to explore the people we can become and courage to make that journey. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I walked into the bank yesterday and, and the girl at the teller, she said, are you ready for Christmas? And I hesitated. I knew what she meant. Had I bought all the presents, was the food ready? I put up the Christmas tree, was the reef on the door? But the question affected me. I began to think, am I ready for Christmas? Am I ready for Christmas? And what's it really all about? Well, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And as hard as our modern world has tried to extinguish the influence of Jesus Christ in our culture, they cannot. Because next Saturday, we're going to celebrate Christmas. I saw a Jewish scholar interviewed last week, and he said, because of Jesus Christ, the world will never again be the same. He said, because of Jesus Christ, men and women will never again think the same. Because of this man who walked the earth 2,000 years, men and women will never live the same, will never be the same. 
And sometimes we lose sight of that, particularly in a turbulent cultural environment, an anti-Christian environment very often. We lose sight of that. We lose sight of the fact that the influence this one man has had on the world is unfathomable. Take all the books that have been written about Christ, all the pages and pages and pages, and put them together, all the paintings, all the art, all the sculptures, all the music, the influence Christ has had on the arts and on literature throughout the ages. And does it occur to us that prior to Christ walking the earth, there was never any such thing as a hospital? When he walked the earth, where were the sick people? They were on the sides of the roads, left out by relatives too scared to get sick themselves, left on the side of the road to die, to waste away. No hospitals before Christ came. No schools. No schools. Until the church introduced education for the masses. There's no such thing as education for the common man. Education was for the elite only. And then the church recognizes through the Gospels the dignity, the value of every single human being and introduces education for the masses. The impact Christ has had on history. And then I want you to add all of that up. I want you to add all of that up. And that is as nothing compared to the impact Christ can have on your life, on my life. The change that Christ can affect in your heart, in my heart. Christmas, it's not about the gifts, it's not about the food, it's about Christ. And why did he come? For his sake? No. To help himself? No. For our sake, to help us, to call us along this journey. How many people were here last time I was here? You remember I was able to move around up here. <laughs> point A, point A, where we are right now, point A, with all our faults, our failings, our flaws, our defects, our talents, our abilities, our potential. Point B, perfection. When we reach perfection, not perfection in a robotic sense, not perfection in the sense that we become the same, but perfection in the sense that at point B, I become perfectly who God created me to be. At point B, you become perfectly who God created you to be. Christ came that we might make this journey, this journey, this transformation from the people that we are to the better people that we know we can be. Close your eyes for a moment, just a minute. Everyone close your eyes. Ask yourself one question. In what one way can I become a better person today? Open your eyes. Does everyone know one way? Yes or yes? yes? Everyone has one way. How long did it take? Three seconds? That's the power of prayer. That's the power of Christ's transforming influence in our life, is to come to this place and to ask ourselves, in what one way can I become more like Jesus Christ today? And then to go out and live that. And that journey is why Christ came. That journey is what begins at Christmas. Is God calling us along the path of salvation, along the journey of the soul. What stops us? The world. The culture. Because you go to the mall and there's music and there's sales and there's... I guess there's no sales at Christmas, is there? <laughs> there's music and there's decorations and we're all in the spirit of Christmas. But what spirit of Christmas? The world spirit of Christmas? The commercial spirit of Christmas? Or the spirit of Christ, which begins, is born in Christmas? What stops us is the world, is the culture, is the culture. It's so difficult to be Christian out there. So difficult. I wasn't very gifted in science, but I learned one thing in science, and that was the idea of osmosis. What is more dense filters through the membrane to what is less dense. What is more dense filters through to what is less dense. And the reality is, is we are less dense 
because we do not prepare ourselves we do not reflect we do not meditate on the reality before us we don't turn to prayer we go out into the world we are less dense and what is more dense filters through and changes what is less dense and we don't have that density we need to take a good hard look at our culture we need to have a good hard look at the world we live in and realize that some part of it is destroying us that we have involved ourselves in a process of self-destruction that is reaching monumental levels what sort of world do we live in we have taller buildings but shorter tempers wider freeways but narrower viewpoints we spend more but have less we buy more but enjoy it less we have bigger houses and smaller families more conveniences but less time we have more degrees but less common sense more knowledge but less judgment more experts but more problems more medicine but less wellness we drink too much smoke too much spend too recklessly laugh too little drive too fast get too angry too quickly stay up too late get up too tired read too seldom watch tv too much and pray too little we have multiplied our possessions but reduced our values we talk too much love too seldom and lie too often we've learned how to make a living but not a life we've added years to life but not life to years we've been all the way to the moon and back but we have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor we've conquered outer space but not inner space we've done larger things but not better things we've cleaned up the air but polluted the soul we've split the atom but not our prejudice we write more but learn less we plan more but accomplish less we've learned how to rush but not to wait we have higher incomes but lower morals more food but less appeasement more acquaintances but fewer friends we build more computers to hold more information to produce more copies than ever but have less communication we've become long on quantity short on quality these are the times of fast food and slow digestion tall men and short character steep profits and shallow relationships these are the times of world peace but domestic warfare more leisure and less fun more kinds of foods and less nutrition these are the days of two incomes but more divorce of fancier houses but broken homes these are the days of quick trips disposable diapers overweight bodies throwaway morality one night stands and pills that do everything from quiet to cheer to kill it is a time when there is much in the showroom window and so very little in the stockroom and this is the culture we go out into every day this is the obstacle to the spirit of christmas and god gently calling us beckoning us to come beyond the shopping and the food the travel to come beyond to go deeper and to discover the real meaning of christmas to draw nearer to the lord the mystery the wonder the miracle of christmas matthew chapter 1 verse 23 and he shall be called emmanuel which means god is with us god is with us in the journey in the journey transforming us transforming us but there's more there is so much more do we have anyone here who is deliriously happy contented and has so much peace in their heart that feels that there is no room for any more <laughs> stand up <laughs> if you're standing just raise your hand <laughs> there's more to life there's more to life but it comes not through having not through doing but by being by becoming the peace the joy the insatiable happiness comes through the journey stop moving along the journey and all of these things disappear these things peace joy and increased ability to love and increased ability to be loved happiness are the byproducts of the journey while you are making the journey 
You are burning the fluids that produce these things. The peace, the joy, the increased ability to love, the increased ability to be loved, and the happiness that we all desire. When we stop making the journey, all of these things disappear because they come from the journey. They are a byproduct of the journey. And we want to make the journey. I believe that. We want to make this journey. We want to grow. We want to change. We want to become better people, but we don't. All we do is take three steps forward, two steps back. Or we fall and we get discouraged. And we give up. We give up. You know, when I was uh, seven years old, I was in grade one of primary school. Grade one of primary school was the best and the worst two years of my life. And I know many of you have heard the story or read the story in one of my books. And the book the story is about, you know, on Friday afternoons, Bell used to go, everyone was happy and excited. I'd go to the school gate, I'd meet my brothers, and they were happy, excited, because the weekend had come. I was miserable. Every week, Friday after Friday, because I love school, no. Because on Friday afternoons, we used to have our spelling test. And I always used to fail. And I remember one Friday afternoon, the school bell went, everyone rushed out of class, ran towards the school gates. I gathered my things together slowly, I packed my school bag, and then I dragged my school bag slowly towards the school gate where I found four of my brothers, once again, very happy and excited because school week had finished and a weekend had come around. But this Friday afternoon, I was particularly sad. And I remember my mother coming to get us as she always used to and she, she parked the car down the street and then she would walk up to the gate and gather us together and then walk us down to the car. And As we got to the car that day she took our bags from us and she threw them in the back of the car and one by one we got in to the back of the car. And I, I remember getting into the car that day and bursting into tears. And my brothers, my brothers they looked at me wondering what was wrong, what had happened. And then my mother got into the car and she saw me crying. And she said, what's wrong? And I explained to her that, you know, I had failed my spelling test again and that the kids had been making fun of me. And I remember my mother taking me home and holding me in her arms and saying, everything is going to be all right. She said to me, we'll practice your spelling and you'll get better. And then she said to me, how many did you get in your spelling test today? And I said, six out of 20. <laughs> you know, the kids used to laugh just like that. <laughs> that used to make me sad. <laughs> but my mother said, that's all right. If you get seven next week, on Friday afternoon, I'll take you straight from school and I'll buy you a big bar of chocolate. I got seven. <laughs> and I got my bar of chocolate and the next week I got eight and another bar of chocolate and the week after that nine and more chocolate and ten and twelve and more chocolate and fourteen and sixteen and more chocolate and eighteen and nineteen and twenty and more chocolate until finally I had developed <laughs> a love for chocolate <laughs> but I could spell I could spell and I learnt the most valuable lesson in transformation. The most valuable lesson in transformation. Because see, we want to make this journey. Yes or yes? yes? We want to do it. But I discovered that people don't fail because they want to fail. People fail because they don't know how to succeed. We don't not make this journey because we don't want to make the journey. We don't make this journey because we don't know enough about the journey. Can anyone here run a marathon? No? Very good. We have, we have a taker down here. But the rest of you can't. And that's really what I want to talk about. You can't run a marathon today. If we went out 
began on the streets of Reading this evening a marathon, it appears that just one young man <laughs> would finish the 26 mile stint. But if for the next week everyone here ran a half a mile, and a week after that everyone ran one mile, and the week after that, one and a half miles. After three weeks, how many people would be able to run a marathon? One. <laughs> what about if we tried really, really hard? One. What about if we tried with all of our might to run a marathon? How many people would be able to? One. Because you see, transformation is not just about trying, it's about training. Transformation is not just about trying, it's about training. You want to be a business leader, what do you do? You go to business school, you train to become a business leader, and then you go out and you get employed by some person who pays you to learn all the mistakes necessary to become a business leader. <laughs> But you train in the process. You want to become an attorney. <laughs> so much opportunity there. But we're in church. <laughs> you want to become an attorney? What do you do? You go to law school. Train to become an attorney. You want to become a school teacher? You go to college, learn to be a school teacher, a doctor, a nurse. Everything we do in our lives, we train. We want to learn to become a great tennis player. What do we do? We train to become a great tennis player. Football, train, golf, train, take lessons, practice, train. Want to become a Christian? We just show up to church on Sunday. <laughs> and that, my friends, is where there is something very serious missing in the equation. Lots of trying and very, very little training. You show up for the game on the weekend and you haven't practiced how you're going to perform. Not well. And so this process, this transformation, this journey, it's not just about trying, it's about training. If all of us, we went out and we ran half a mile, increasing by half a mile, five days a week, every week, after a year, how many people would be able to run a marathon? Probably quite a number of us. Not all of us, no. But everyone here would be able to run further than they are able to run tonight. Further and faster. Because the human being has a natural capacity to increase its abilities. Physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Run faster physically. Love more. Love more deeply emotionally. Learn new things, expand the mind intellectually and expand the spirit spiritually. And it's that expansion of spirit that is where the essence of Christmas lies. Because it's in that expansion of spirit that we make this journey. Ultimately through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer, what is it? Well, the world has no value for prayer today. Why? Because the world only values two things. Present culture, what you do, and what you have. And when you sit down in a quiet place and close your eyes and commune with God, open yourself up to God, you don't increase what you have and you appear to be doing nothing. And so the world believes this is a waste of time. It has no value. So we don't pray. We fall for the greatest lie in history. We turn our backs on prayer and enter into the chaos and complexities of the modern world where our very self is swallowed up. So much so that most people on the planet don't even know who they are. Don't even know what they're here for. Don't have a sense of mission or purpose in their lives. Don't know what they want to achieve. And life passes by them like that. Do you ever have a dream? 
and you wake up in the middle of the dream, it's a really good dream. You know, probably you're dreaming you're winning the US Masters or something like that. You wake up in the middle of the dream, what do you want to do? Go back to sleep. <laughs> so you hit the snooze button, you go back to sleep, but what happens? You try to go back to sleep, can't get back to sleep. Even if you can get back to sleep, the dream doesn't return. The dream doesn't return. Life is that dream. Life is that dream. Passing quickly. Very short. The one immutable truth that we can all agree on, that we're all aware of, is that one day we will die. And yet most of us live as if we were immortal in this life. Life is short, short, passing by like a dream. To live it, to live it passionately, to live it enthusiastically, to use it to a worthy purpose, we need to step back from life, to step into the classroom of silence, to turn to prayer, to turn to reflection, to cultivate soul, to cultivate the soul. Because that's one thing about our culture. It is soulless. It is soulless. It is the void of personality and passion. In its truest and purest forms, it is soulless. Cultivate soul, turn to our God, embrace our God. And discover that there is more to life than increasing the speed. And that what you become is infinitely more important than what you do or what you have. Life. Life's about relationships. It's about love. It's about love. How are your relationships this Christmas? The thing we fail to recognize is that our human relationships are a reflection of our relationship with God. Sit down tomorrow and think about your relationship with God. Take some notes. What are the 10 things, what are the 10 ways you would characterize your relationship with God? And you will find those 10 characteristics in the relationships you share with other people on this earth. Love. Caught up in doing and having and, and missing the journey. Missing the love. I want you, if you're here tonight with your spouse, I want you to take your spouse's hand now. And I want you to, I want you to think of, of the time when you were married. And I want you to think of all the love you have experienced with this person. And if that relationship has grown cold, I want you to open yourself up to a rekindling of that relationship. And now I want you, if you're here with your child, your child sitting next to you, I want you to take your child's hand with the other hand. And I want you to think of the joy that has come through those moments, the love that has been born in your life through that child. And now I want the rest of you to take the hands of the people around you. And to, to feel that person next to you human being, individual, unique, created in the likeness of God, created to love and be loved, to love and be loved. And now I want you to imagine all the love that you have ever experienced in your whole life. I want you to close your eyes, to think about all the love you have ever experienced in all of your whole life. And all the love that has ever been expressed between two people anywhere at any time. And now, I want you to multiply that by infinity and take it to the depths of eternity. And you will still have barely a glimpse of the love of God. 
And I want you to allow that love to come into your life. And now, I want you to ask that God, I want you to ask that God to heal my friend Jim Willick. Life, my friends, life is love. And to make this journey and to not love deeply is to have missed something of life, is to have caused yourself an injustice which is incalculable. Now this Christmas, discover the love, fall in love again with yourself, with your spouse, with your children, with your God, and with life. Make this journey. Make this journey. It's a difficult journey. And you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about... I've been thinking a lot lately about what Jim's going through. And I've been thinking a lot about life and what's it all about? And how do you live it? And how do you live it, not just survive, but how do you thrive? How do you thrive in this journey? How do you thrive in this time we have? And I discovered that, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's crossing the room to, you know, ask a girl out on a date, or whether it's forgiving someone who has hurt you, or whether it's opening yourself up to rekindling a love that has grown cold, or whether it's starting a business or excelling in sports or looking yourself in the mirror physically and spiritually opening yourself up to God you need this you need courage you need courage to do anything in life the most common characteristic of our age is not courage but fear Fear, and fear paralyzes the human being that wants to strive, wants to thrive, which wants to increase, which wants to go forth and excel passionately and enthusiastically. Fear stifles all of that. And what builds this fear in us? Well, ultimately, fear of losing, fear of failing. Largest business in the world today is what? Anybody? Uh, Industry. Largest industry in the world today is anybody? Insurance. Based on what human emotion? Fear of losing what we have worked for. Fear of losing what we have. And while we foster that fear, We lose something much more valuable than what we have. We lose who we are. We surrender self, become a clone of the modern world. Yes, we do more than we've ever done in any other age as a human race. We have more than we've ever had in any other age, abundantly. But who are we? What sort of people are we becoming? Taller men with shorter characters. God calls us into the classroom of silence to prayer, to fill us with courage, to fill us with courage to go out and follow our hearts, to follow his call through the deepest desires of our hearts, through our dreams. And it takes courage. The face of criticism. People want to put us down. People want to say, no, don't do that. Go back and keep the safe spot in the journey. And we convince ourselves that we can sit over here, build a little white fence with a little little white house, with a little white picket fence around it. And we tell ourselves that we can be happy there forever. Spiritually, we can't be. Human spirit thrives on the journey, changing, growing, developing, becoming the better person we know we can be. But it takes courage takes courage. 
If I told you one year from today, you will die. What would you do with the next year of your life? Do those things. Go home tonight. Make a list. And do those things. And at the top of the list, draw nearer to the Lord. Draw nearer. It's life. It's about holiness. It's about imitation of Christ. It's about becoming more like Jesus Christ. For his sake, no. To help him, no. To make him happy, no. For our sake. To help us. To bring us the happiness that we desire more than anything else in the whole world. Wouldn't you like to work for someone like Jesus? Would that be nice? Yes or yes? Would you like to be married to someone like Jesus? Would you like to date someone like Jesus? Now, if you're married... Would you like to have friends like Jesus? Like to spend your time with people like this, yeah? Why? Because there's something that just attracts us to that holiness. You know, I've said it over and over and over again, and you're sick to death of hearing it, but there is nothing more attractive than holiness. When you meet somebody who has that, that peace, that joy, that ability to love, that ability to be present to the people in their lives, that ability to bring joy to other people's lives, that openness and selflessness to making a difference in other people's lives, that courage to pursue dreams in the face of criticism and difficulty. When you meet someone like that, what happens? You want to be with someone like that. Why? Because there is nothing more attractive than holiness. When Jesus was walking on the earth, what happened? People wanted to be with him wherever he was. If he was walking down the street or teaching in the synagogue or eating in someone's home, what happened? They crowded around him. Why? Because there is nothing more attractive than holiness. They wanted what he had. They wanted to be a part of what we were as a part of. You want to be with people like Jesus. You want to work for people like Jesus. You want to work with people like Jesus. You want to be married to people like Jesus. Be the person that you want to be with. Be the person. You know, I've witnessed an amazing thing this year. Tom, who works with me, got married in September. And him and Anne-Marie, his new wife, moved to Steubenville. And their relationship is something to be amazed at. It, it is awe-inspiring. And I remember Tom saying to me, leading up to the wedding, I remember he said to me, he said, you know, it's a struggle to make a decision like this, but once you meet the right person, he said, because all my life I have known that 90% of my happiness or my misery will come from that one decision. I said, to, I said to Tom, I said, now what's, what do you guys have that you know, I don't see in so many other relationships? And he said, it's just as important to be the right person as to find the right person. And I think that we're forever looking for the right person, looking for the right people, looking for the right person in the person we married 20 years ago. Sure, she's here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> looking for, and we spend so little energy being the right person, becoming the right person, entering into the classroom of silence and taking off layer upon layer of self-importance and ego and recognizing that we have faults and failings to work on. Because what makes a dynamic, enriching, enthusiastic, passionate relationship? Two people making this journey. Two people dedicated to the journey, dedicated to becoming. Most of the rest of the world is dedicated to doing and having. And they apply these principles to relationships. It's about becoming 
about the journey, it's about transformation. Don't just try. I know you're trying really hard. Don't just try. Train. How? Come to prayer every morning. What one way can I make my spouse's day today? In what one way can I make my girlfriend's day today? In what one way can I make my boyfriend's day today? What one way? Make that person's day every day by becoming the better person. Yeah, flowers are great. Do that often. Chocolates are wonderful. Do that more often. <laughs> but all of that is the overflow. Is the overflow. And you know what we lose? We lose in relationships today. Well, see, the modern world believes that everything should be understood. No room for religion because, hey, it's a mystery. Can't understand it all. It's a mystery. So pfft. everything has to be understood. Anything that's valid must be able to be understood. Relationships. Key to relationships in the modern world's view, understanding got to understand the other person. It's a myth. It's unrealistic. It never happens. My mother told me the secret to relationships when I was very young. She said, Matthew, he said, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache if you don't think that the key to relationships is understanding women. She said, women are not to be understood. <laughs> she, said, she said, women are not to be understood. They're to be accepted. <laughs> and the reverse is also true. The key to relationships is not understanding people. Oh, yeah, I think that maybe, yeah, I'm going to fall in love with you, but I've got to understand you before I can... Never. It's acceptance. It's accepting that this person is at a point A. Faults, failings, flaws, defects, talents, abilities, potential. It's accepting that the person is broken. That the person has inner conflicts, inner tensions has inconsistencies and that the person is making a journey. It's accepting the person in that journey. It's nurturing the person in that journey. It's not understanding everything about the person before you can give yourself, before you can nurture that, that person in the journey. To love is to accept. It's to accept. Prayer is the training in relationships. Prayer is the training in, relation, in our relationship with God. Yes, in this journey, coming to prayer, classroom of silence, developing one way. Each day we can grow to become more like Jesus, the better person we know we can be. Going out and dedicating ourselves to that transformation, transforming our relationships, coming to the classroom of silence, entering into prayer, asking ourselves, in what one way can I make this relationship better today? In what one way can I make my spouse's day today? And transforming the relationships, not just trying, training. And you know, if you go out and you run three miles today and one mile tomorrow and four miles next week and three weeks off, four trips to McDonald's every day and two miles the week after that and one mile here and one mile, you won't run a marathon. You won't compete at any high level. You will not excel. You will not achieve in the upper realms. Consistent, consistent training produces results. Don't just try. Train. Go home and write up the training program spiritually. What's it going to be? I know some of you were at, at Nativity earlier in the year, and I spoke there about what transformed my life? What brings me here right now before you tonight? When I was 19, God touched my life in a special way. 
had a special experience that touched my life, yes. Did it transform me? No, it didn't. But what happened was that through that, I began to stop by my church every Sunday, no, every day, for 10 minutes a day. I used to sit up the back, second last pew, and I used to plan my day. Think about what I'm going to do today and plan my day. And after about two weeks, I worked out that this wasn't prayer. And I decided that, you know, I wasn't doing anyone justice or helping anyone by sitting back. What was I even in a church for? To plan my day. And then I began to pray. And then my life began to change. I began to look up to the Lord and say, God, you know what? I've got these things happening in my life. I've got this problem. This is the situation. These are the circumstances. What do you think I should do? And then my life really began to change. When was the last time? When was the last time you sat down here, looked up to the Lord and said, what do you think I should do, Lord? You will learn more from your friends than you ever will from books. Choose your friends wisely and make Jesus the first. Prayer. Turn to prayer. What do you think I should do, Lord? Training. Don't just try. Train. What else does it take to make this journey? It takes perseverance. It takes perseverance. People of the world, they have it. Your Bill Gates, your Michael Jordans, they've got it. Last time I checked, perseverance was a Christian virtue. They've got it. And we ain't. It's not very good English, is it? Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, do you know who he is? <laughs> How's this for a story of perseverance? Lincoln was born into poverty in 1809 in Illinois, and throughout his whole life he continually faced failure and defeat and crisis and criticism, but he pushed on. He twice failed in business, he lost eight elections, and he suffered a total nervous breakdown at one point. Defeat and failure were always beckoning Lincoln to give up, to quit, to take a place in the backward corners, the quiet place, to live the safe and secure life. But he was called to something more. This is a sketch of Abraham Lincoln's life. In 1816, Lincoln's family was forced out of their home and he had to go to work to support them. In 1818, his mother died. In 1831, he failed in business. In 1832, he ran for state legislator and lost. In 1832, he also lost his job. In 1832, he also decided he wanted to go to law school, but his application was rejected. In 1833, Lincoln borrowed some money from a friend to begin a business. By the end of the year, the business had failed, was bankrupt, and Lincoln spent the next 17 years of his life paying off that debt. In 1834, he ran for the state legislator again and lost. In 1835, he was engaged to be married, but his fiancée died, and it broke his heart. In 1836, Lincoln suffered a total nervous breakdown and spent more than six months in bed. In 1838, he sought to become Speaker of the state legislator and was defeated, in 1840, he sought to become a lector and was defeated. In 1843, he ran for Congress and lost. In 1846, he ran for Congress again. This time he won, and Lincoln made his way to Washington. In 1848, Lincoln ran for re-election to Congress and lost. In 1849, he sought the job of land officer, land officer, in his home state of Illinois and was rejected. In 1854, he ran for the Senate of the United States and lost again. In 1856, he sought the vice presidential nomination at his party's national convention. He got less than 100 votes and lost. In 1858, he ran for the United States Senate again and lost again. And in 1860, in 1860, Lincoln decided to run for president. I mean, based on what? <laughs> Uh, 
track record. <laughs> he won. He won. And this is what he said. He said, the path was worn and slippery. My foot slipped from under me, knocking the other foot out of the way. But I recovered. And I said to myself, it's a slip, not a fall. It's a slip, not a fall. Make the journey. Come to this place. Point A, enter into prayer. Come into the classroom of silence. Ten minutes a day. Ten minutes a day. And I promise you, your life will change. Open yourself up to God's workings in your life. Open yourself up to the man who has formed and changed history forever. Open yourself up to Jesus, who is mentor, who is guide, who is teacher, who is friend, who is saviour. Because despite the influence he's had on history, this influence is nothing compared to what he wants to do in your life. Nothing. He wants to bring you peace. He wants to bring you peace. And that, my friends, is the gift of Christmas. To have that peace that runs deep, that is born in silence from a connection with God. To have that peace. And when you look into people's eyes, they will know that you are different. They will want what you have got. And then people will come. People will most definitely come. They'll build a bigger church here because there won't be enough room for people. They'll want what we have got. They'll want to be a part of the enthusiasm and the passion that we have for life. When we have that attraction, we become Christian. We become worthy advertisements for Christ in the world. We know that he is our friend. Are we his? Are we his? To come into the classroom and to, to recognize the priorities, to recognize the priorities are remiss in our lives. It doesn't matter how much we have. It doesn't matter what we do. There's more important things. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I don't want to know. I want to know what you ache for. And if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dreams, for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow. If you have been opened by life's betrayals or have become shriveled and closed for fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it or fade it or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy of life fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic or to remember the limitations of being a human being. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true or not. I want to know if you can disappoint another person to be true to yourself. If you can bear the accusation of betrayal and not betray your own soul. I want to know if you can be faithful and therefore be trustworthy. I want to know if, if you can see the beauty even when it's not pretty every day. And if in that beauty you can source your life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand on the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of a full moon. It doesn't interest me to know where you live 
or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and do what needs to be done for the children. It doesn't interest me who you are or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where you studied or what you studied or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when everything else falls away. I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly like the company you keep in those empty moments. Peace. To come to this place and to find a peace that brings priority and perspective to life. Because then we begin to look beyond ourselves and discover that this Christmas a lot of people out there who will be lonely, who will be hungry, people who are broken hearted, people who have lost loved ones this year and Christmas will never again be the same, people who are hurting in places so deep within them that we hardly have a chance to reach that deep but who desperately need us to try. The power of Christianity making a difference in the world. Don't forget to this Christmas. Visit the lonely, feed the hungry. Make a difference. Make a difference. Be the difference that makes the difference. Because the good we do doesn't die in a single action. The good we do lives on forever in other people, in other places, in other times. The good we do never dies contagious and growing. You walk down the street, you smile at a person, what do they do back? They smile back. You walk down the street, you smile at a person, they give you a stone face. But you walk down the same street the next day, you see the same person, you smile at the person, what do they do? Smile back. You caught them unawares the day before. <laughs> Love begets love. Love demands a response and love decides the response. Because love begets love. So easy. So easy to make a difference in this world of ours. This Christmas, open your present, buy lots of presents, give more presents than ever. Eat lots of food, plenty of chocolate, <laughs> but share the gifts, share the gifts, because those that have, have a responsibility to share with those that have not. The gap in our society is ever increasing between the people that have and the people that have not. And I tell you, my friends, at some point, something is going to break. It can't go on like that. The inequality can't exist. These two worlds cannot exist side by side. And if we do not do something to narrow that gap, there will be some type of revolution. It is natural, it is inevitable. History teaches us time and time and time again. This Christmas, visit the lonely, visit the sick, visit the poor, share what you have, but next year, Next year, make resolution to narrow that economic gap that exists in our society. We cannot ignore it as Christians. We cannot ignore it. In every age, in every place, there are always going to be some that have more than others. The responsibility and the burden falls upon the shoulders of those men and women to share the gifts. It falls upon our shoulders to share our gifts Time, treasure, and talent. Christmas. New Year's resolutions. Anyone got any yet? I know it's really early. <laughs> Does anyone have New Year's resolutions? Yes? No? 
Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> no one has New Year's resolution. Excellent. You'll be open to the one I wish to propose. On the first day, God began his creation. On the sixth day, he finished. What did he do on the seventh day? Yes. Rested. Why did he rest on the seventh day? Because he was tired? No. Because he knew we would be tired. Because he knew we would be tired. Everything in creation has rhythm. The tides come in and go out to a rhythm. The way a plant grows around the process of photosynthesis is based on a rhythm. The way a heart beats, pumping the lifeblood around your body, is based on a rhythm. The way the stars and the moon and the planets move is based on a rhythm. Everything in creation has rhythm. When an element of creation maintains its rhythm, it maintains optimum health. When it loses the rhythm, it creates chaos. And we have lost the rhythm of life. We've become too busy. We've become too busy. We do too many things. Don't you feel that if you weren't so busy, you could be happier? Don't you feel that if you weren't so busy, you could have more peace in your life? Don't you feel that if you weren't so busy, you could feel more fulfilled? Get more of the things done that are really important? Don't you feel that if you weren't so busy, you could maybe even be a better person? Don't you feel like sometimes you just need a day off? Yeah, God thought of it first. He called it Sunday. He called it Sunday. Take Sundays off. Learn to say no. Learn to say no. Learn to say, this is time for me and my family to nurture ourselves physically, emotionally, intellectually and spiritually. Go on a picnic. Take a long walk in a quiet place. Go to church. Read a book. You know, look, up, look up one of those books you studied your last year in high school. Look up one of those books you studied your last year in high school and read it again and discover how much you've changed in the last 10 years. <laughs> read some poetry. Write some poetry. Sit in a dark room and listen to loud music. Have a candlelit dinner. Pray a little bit extra. Pray a little bit extra. Get a little bit of extra exercise. Eat a nice big bowl of chocolate ice cream. <laughs> if you have children, make some memories. Because they grow up like that. Their childhood disappears into the air. Fall in love again with life. Write a love letter. Read one of those books you've been meaning to read for so long now. Watch a sunset. Dance. Rediscover life. Watch the children in the playground playing. The famous Russian novelist Dostoevsky said, the soul is healed by being with children. Bake a cake. Look up an old friend. Look up an old friend. See how life is treating him or her. Step back from life. Discover that there's more. Discover that there, while we're caught up in having and doing, we're missing life. Rediscover some of the passion of life. Rediscover the enthusiasm of life. And take that out during the week and share it. With the people you work with, people you meet along the way, give yourselves a chance. Give yourselves a chance in this modern world to maintain some level of sanity. Rediscover the rhythm of life. Rediscover the rhythm of life. As we finish tonight, I'd like to leave you with, with a story. Once upon a time, on a summer's evening, a banquet was held in an ancient castle in the hills on the outskirts of London. And the evening was to be celebrated not with music, 
or with speeches, but with the presence of a famous English actor. The people enjoyed a sumptuous meal. The castle was radiant. And at the end of the meal, the host stood up, introduced himself again to the people, and explained that this evening, instead of music, instead of dancing, instead of speeches, they had invited a superior Shakespearean actor to make a presentation to them. The actor stood up and he spoke eloquently, powerfully, moving the people, inspiring the people for 45 minutes, reciting famous passages from various Shakespearean writings. And after each presentation, the audience applauded and the thunderous applause would echo through the castle. And when he had finished, the, the actor said that he would be willing to take requests. If anyone wanted some Shakespearean writing recited, if he knew it, he would be happy to do his best. And several people raised their hands, and one person asked for the 14th sonnet, and another person for a repeat of the soliloquy from Macbeth, and another person for the closing verses of A Midsummer's Night's Dream. And then an old man, about halfway down the banquet hall, raised his hands, and the actor called on him. And as it turned out, the old man was a priest. And he said, Sir, I know it's not Shakespearean, but I was wondering whether you might recite for us the 23rd Psalm. The actor paused and then spoke up saying, I would be happy to, Father, on one condition. And that is that when I'm finished, you in turn recite the psalm for us. And the priest, he was, was taken aback and a little embarrassed now. And he hesitated but he really wanted to hear the actor recite the psalm. So finally he spoke up, saying, very well. The crowd hushed, and the actor began in his powerful and moving voice, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. And when he finished, the audience stood and applauded for minutes on end. And the applause echoed through the chamber and up through the castle. And finally, the crowd settled, returned to their seats. And the actor looked over to the priest and said, Father, it's your turn now. And the priest stood up and he shifted in his place. He looked down at the table, took a deep breath, and in a voice that was deeply meditative, he began, The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides peaceful waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid. For the Lord is at my side. His rod and his staff, they comfort and protect me. He sets a table for me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will live 
in the house of the Lord forever. And when the priest had finished, not a sound could be heard. Nobody moved. Nobody smoked. Nobody applauded. A profound silence had come upon the castle. And as the old priest gently sat down in his chair, every set of eyes in that banquet room was fixed on him with awestruck amazement. And capturing the moment, the, the actor stood back up. He said, my friends, do you realize what you've witnessed here tonight? And he continued saying, he said, the difference is I know the psalm, but Father, Father knows the shepherd. This Christmas, and as your New Year's resolution, get to know the shepherd. God bless you all.